so Mike, should we be worried about the consequences of same-sex marriage for religious freedom? Yes, I think we should be worried about the consequences of same-sex marriage for religious freedom. Um, uh, I, my, myself, I think we're not talking about how do we magnify choice in, in the same-sex marriage debate. Uh, we're talking about the way that the state imposes a particular set of views mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on people uh, and on religious people in particular. Uh, it's one of the areas where, where actually we realise that uh, the state uh, and the public square, so to speak, is constantly spreading out. Uh, when I was a, a kid back in the day, uh, the differentiation between public and private was quite a comfortable one uh, because the private sphere was really very, very big. Mm. Uh, over the course of my lifetime, uh, what has consistently happened is that uh, the state, by expanding the public square, has squeezed the private more and more mm -hmm. to the extent that we now have faith schools uh, being interrogated by the state about whether they're teaching uh, politically correct views uh, about same sex. Mm -hmm. Now, that would have been unthinkable uh, sort of 30 years ago, uh, or actually even 20 years ago or 15 years mm -hmm. ago. Uh, but the public square has simply expanded and expanded and expanded. Uh, and to that extent, we actually are getting to the point where, although it's in a democratic form, uh, the private sphere uh, is more and more regulated. Mm. Uh, and the kind of really pinch point uh, for many of us is what can we teach our children uh, and how can we teach uh, our, our children? That's, that's really significant. That means, uh, I think, that we're getting closer and closer to the point where we're saying, so what am I going to put first? That's always the religious freedom question. What am I going to put first? Am I going to put my loyalty to my God first, or am I going to put my obedience to the state mm. first? Uh, that, in a sense, is exactly the question uh, that Karl Barth and other German theologians were asking in 1934 uh, when they issued the Bauman Declaration. Uh, and the, the first part of that is, uh, we must listen first to Jesus Christ as he's revealed in the scriptures. Uh, rather than rather than anything else. So can you tell us more about the Barman Declaration? Well, what had happened, uh, obviously, is that Hitler had uh, got not precisely a, a majority mandate, but certainly a very significant electoral mandate in 1933, mm. uh, forms a government uh, as, uh, as chancellor. And there's a movement within the German churches uh, of so-called German Christians, uh, which is saying, not that we deny that Jesus rose from the dead or, or whatever, but that actually our German nationalism stands alongside it. Mm. So it's not an, it's a both and. Uh, and the Barman Declaration was saying, no, it cannot be both and, it's Christ first. Mm. That's, that's the issue. So when Christ says this, that's who we obey. Uh, and the state does not have the right to uh, actually uh, make demands of me uh, that Christ has forbidden. Uh, it's as straightforward as it's as straightforward as that. So, uh, if uh, uh, the, the the minister who is instructed, yes, you must conduct a same-sex marriage mm. service because you would conduct a heterosexual marriage service, uh, actually, at that point, has to say no, uh, because uh, the the primacy, prime obedience is actually owed, owed to, uh, to to Christ rather than anything else. Now, of course, uh, some people will say, oh, well, isn't that just special pleading? But actually, it's a pretty normal thought when you stop and think about it uh, that, of course, uh, an awful lot of people in Western democratic culture uh, think there's a limit to what the state can lay down for me. Mm. There really is. Uh, and the way that they would characteristically put it is, the state is not God. Uh, and actually, we want to say, I meant that. The state is not God. Uh, at which point, on an issue like this, it shouldn't pretend that it is. Mm. Uh, and that's, I think, one of the ways that we need to cast this argument. The state is not God. God is God. Uh, and we will obey him first. Even though, uh, and this is the hard bit, even though we may lose our buildings... Uh, and even though some of us may in fact be locked up, uh, that happens across the world. 
uh, and the fact that it's going to happen in a much more kind of genteel way uh, in the Anglophone West, and that we may not be locked up, but we will lose our buildings and possibly a second car, uh, that that's uh, a, a bullet to be bitten, I'm afraid. Now, at this stage in the UK, we haven't seen that. Is that right? We haven't seen that sort of civil disobedience needing to actually take place? Or are you saying it's already started to happen uh, in some places in the UK? Well, the person, for instance, who refuses to uh, decorate a wedding cake for a same-sex couple and is prosecuted successfully. Mm -hmm. uh, in that sense, yes, it's already taking place. Uh, so I'd say it's happening on an individual scale. Uh, is it happening across the board? Uh, no. Uh, but one of the things one has to bear in mind is that uh, uh, in so many of these areas, actually what happens is a chilling effect. Mm. Uh, and you think, uh, oh, no, I, I, I couldn't afford for my small business to be involved in, uh, in a discrimination lawsuit. Uh, so actually that kind of sort of Damocles hanging over people is really quite significant. Mm. Uh, and the breadth of the way that the laws are phrased uh, and the fact that so much discretion actually vests in the kind of investigating and enforcement agency mm. uh, actually is really very significant. Mm. Uh, so you have, uh, at the moment in the UK, a nominal adherence uh, to freedom of religion, but it's intriguing over the last 10 years how frequently in cases, actually, whenever freedom of religion comes into conflict with any other right, mm. uh, the other right wins. Mm. Uh, so uh, is there a nominal adherence to freedom of religion in the UK? Yes, provided it doesn't matter. <laughs> so Mike, the Barman Declaration, that happened during Nazi Germany, a totalitarian state. Uh, are you just being alarmist? No, I don't think I'm being alarmist. Uh, people sometimes react uh, to, to the parallel with 1934 when the Barman Declaration was issued. Uh, and say, oh, well, you know, whoever mentions the Holocaust loses or something something like that. Uh, but, of course, there does come a point where you have to say, why are we making the parallel, and is it an apt parallel, even though it sounds extreme? So why make this particular parallel? You're right, Nazi Germany is a totalitarian regime. Totalitarianism takes various forms. Uh, the point of describing something as totalitarian is to say that actually everything is being treated all together and the claims of the state are total uh, and all kind of dissent is gradually being scrubbed out. Now, at that point, you say, so what's happening here? Uh, what's happening in our schools where uh, someone with same-sex attraction has to be affirmed uh, in that attraction uh, in various ways? Well, the state is saying this is what must happen. Uh, that's pretty total. Uh, and what's more, uh, the expression of alternative opinions is gradually being excluded. That's pretty total too. Now, of course, when we're talking about Nazi Germany, we're talking about a terrible form of totalitarianism. Mm. Uh, but it is possible for totalitarianism to have a smiling face. So if you're looking for an example of a totalitarian state, uh, then think of the Truman Show. And what happens to Truman there? It has a smiling face. Uh, people are nice to him uh, at various points in that particular movie. But actually, it's totalitarian. Uh, the issue is not, is this a smiling face or not? Everyone thinks that Western democracies have smiling faces quite a lot of the time. The issue is not the smiling face. The issue is the claim of power. That's the thing. Mm -hmm.